of gender inequality. How gender balance can transform the global economy. Naila Kabir, London School of Economics and Political Science. When the Berlin Wall fell, I was in London glued to the television. I knew I was watching history in the making, but not how it was going to affect us all. I would like to talk to you about a wall, a set of walls today, that affects all of us in this room and beyond. These are the walls in the economy, and they affect the terms on which men and women engage in the labor market. I'm interested in the labor market because even today, most of the world's men and many of the world's women survive and put food on the table for their children through selling their labor. And we are seeing more and more women joining the labor market here and elsewhere. Now, policymakers have become very interested in the topic of gender equality in the labor market because there is a great deal of evidence to suggest that greater equality in the, gen in, in, great equality in the marketplace will contribute to economic growth. So we see this headline from 2006 in The Economist, forget China, forget India, forget the internet. Women drive global growth. And this year, the McKinsey Institute has brought out another survey which claims that if men and women could participate in the, in the labor market in identical terms, this would add $28 trillion to global growth, which seems like quite a lot of money. But of course, feminist economists have been interested in gender equality in the labor market for a somewhat different set of reasons. And that is that research tells us that access to paid work can help to transform women's position within the home and in the wider economy. As my friend Stephanie Seguino says, inequalities in the labor market underpin inequalities in many other walks of life, in survival, in health, well-being, and rights. Now, we cannot assume that all women want to work in the paid economy, but what we can safely assume is that women want to be given the same freedom as men to choose to do work, paid work, if they want to, and if they choose to do paid work, they would like the same chances of finding decent work. So, I became very interested in this argument about gender equality and economic growth, and I carried out a review of the evidence behind it. But at the same time, I also carried out a review of the evidence about whether economic growth contributes to gender equality. And what I found is that there seems to be very robust evidence for the first set of relationships, gender equality contributing growth, but very dodgy, inconsistent, and not very persuasive evidence that growth contributes to gender equality. So let's have a look at this. The way in which gender equality contributes to economic growth is through a number of pathways. And we have very sound evidence that the first of these pathways, family-mediated pathways, seems to work. That across the world, Women's access to economic resources, such as paid employment, land, credit, transfers, is more likely than those resources in the hands of men to translate into the well-being, health, and education of their children. This reflects their primary role in looking after the family. What, and that means that they are investing in the productivity of the next generation of workers. So this is the indirect contribution to growth. There's less evidence for the direct contribution. We don't find that women's incomes are much larger than those of men in the calculations of the GNP. The reason, of course, is that women are much more likely to be engaged in the unpaid reproductive work of looking after family and children, and that does not count in GNP. And when they do participate in the economy, these responsibilities mean that they participate in forms of work where their returns are lower. So why is this? Let's unpack this set of findings. First, we find that, women, that there are major inequalities 
in assets and capabilities, in land, in access to capital, in training, all the things which make for productivity. So there are inequalities there. But secondly, we find that the returns to the same level of, in, uh, of assets and, and training, etc., is lower for women than for men. Now, that's not because women are less efficient. Sometimes it's direct discrimination, but more often it is about where they are located in the economy. There is an occupational hierarchy in the economy, and by and large across the world, we find that women are in the less well-paid, more precarious, more part-time jobs. So why is that? Well, one, of course, is the point that I made earlier, and that is their major responsibility for unpaid reproductive work. That means when they do go out to the market and try and earn a living, they do so on disadvantaged terms. Some of this work is going into the calculations of growth, but some of it is not. Now, many economists believe that women choose to do this unpaid reproductive work, and therefore, they must live with the inequalities in the marketplace that this generates. Well, many women do choose to do such work, and they enjoy doing such work. But we are having more and more, finding more and more evidence that many women do not do it out of choice. Uh, a series of surveys from India, for instance, national surveys tell us that increasing percentages of women say they are doing unpaid domestic work out of compulsion, not out of choice. We have a great deal of research, including my own, that tells us when women want to take up work, they often face violence within the home, especially from husbands who are worried about the empowerment potential. And of course, we are seeing in Europe and Asia many women choosing not to have children because they do not want the responsibilities of both looking after children and working in the marketplace. So there is evidence that this is not always a matter of choice. There is very interesting studies. There are some interesting stories coming out of the research um, which tells us about how these inequalities work. One, these are both uh, experimental studies, and both involved giving transfers in cash and kind to small-scale entrepreneurs in Sri Lanka and in Ghana. Very interesting findings. In Sri Lanka, the same transfers to male and female entrepreneurs resulted in zero increase in returns to women's enterprises and very positive increases in men's enterprises. Why was that? Because if we divide the enterprises into female-dominated, male-dominated, and mixed, we find that the female-dominated enterprises are earning far less than the male-dominated and mixed are in between. So women in the mixed enterprises earned more than the average women, and men in the mixed enterprises earned less than the average man. In Ghana, on the other hand, where there was a more of a diverse, diversity in scales, men earned the increases, women at the poorer end, the smaller end of the enterprise continuum, did not report any increases, but women at the larger end reported increases that were higher than the average increases for men. So what was happening there is the women at the larger end came from a different class. They came from a more educated class, they had more access to formal finance, they had started out with larger assets. So class, disadvantage, class advantage at one end of the spectrum helps to offset some of the disadvantage of gender. But at the other end of the spectrum, class disadvantage reinforces the disadvantages associated with gender, as does disadvantages of caste and race and ethnicity. So it is at the other end of the income, wages, earning spectrum that we find the largest gender gaps in returns to women's labor. And this, of course, is a problem, because when feminists talk about the transformative potential of women's work, they're talking about regular, decent, predictable forms of jobs, not these casual and uh, precarious forms of work. So we can understand now why economic growth does not translate systematically into gender, inequality, gender equality, because it has to go through all these barriers before it filters down to women. Now, 
Feminist economics has started to influence mainstream economics sufficiently that we are finding a convergence in the kind of policy agenda that we need to bring down the walls in the economy. So my colleagues in the World Bank are, in a sense, echoing what we have been saying for a long time. We need to get rid of discriminatory reg regulation, inheritance laws that privilege men over women in property. We need to get rid, we need to address uh, the gap in lifelong learning opportunities and training. We need to support women's unpaid work through family-friendly policies in this part of the world, perhaps, but through infrastructure development and so on that reduces the burden of unpaid work. But this actually will bring about a revolution in the way the economy is run. And to bring about that revolution, we need political will and social support. And that political will and social support is unlikely to be forthcoming unless we address at least two conceptual walls that prevent us from taking action. The first of these is the wall between unpaid reproductive work and paid productive work. We need to break down those walls and recognize their interdependence. Without the unpaid reproductive work that goes on on a daily and intergenerational basis, we would have no labor force and we would have no economy. Behind that, and almost foundational in, its, in terms of other inequalities in society, are the conceptual walls that divide our ideas about masculinity and femininity, that straight jacket us into one or other side of a binary divide, that determine one half of the population is good at looking after the children, and the other half of the population is good at going out and earning an income. To dismantle those conceptual walls would allow us to engage in multiple models of masculinity and femininity, multiple ways of being men and women, some of which might overlap. And allowing that flexibility in deciding our gender identities will also make it possible to choose our role in an interconnected economy on the basis of our preferences, our talents, and our abilities. It will make it possible for men to stay at home if they want to, to look after the family without feeling less men, without feeling unmanned. And it will make it possible for women to go out and run corporations without necessarily feeling guilty. So thank you very much.